So I'll, I'll just get going. So I'm Stuart Phillipson, and I'm from the University of Manchester. Um, we've got two talk slots now, but we're just going to do them as, as one 30-minute one talk. Um, and this is James Perrin, who'll be covering the other half. So I'm just going to do a quick overview about the University of Manchester and then talk a little bit about a project that we've run recently. Um, uh, we call it the DAS project. So DAS stands for the Disability Advisory Support Service. So if I use the term DAS, I'm talking either about students studying with disabilities or um, the office that provides them with support. Um, so a quick bit of information about the University of Manchester. So uh, this is the lovely Sackville Street building where we, uh, where we work, and our offices are up here in this nice turret. Um, uh, so uh, we are a large uh, UK university, so we have about 27,000 undergraduates, uh, a total of about 40,000 students, if you include PhDs and postdocs. Um, there's about 12,000 staff, but there's only uh, six which look after our lecture capture service. And we have about 240 buildings, and almost every single one of them has lecture capture equipment in. So we use uh, Galacaster on generic PCs to do the recordings. We use Opencast to do all the management, distribution, and processing. And then we use a video portal that I'll show you a screenshot of in a second. Uh, so just briefly in numbers, so the, the data in the abstract is actually out of date already because I had to go through and calculate um, you know, uh, how much stuff we're recording currently. But we have uh, 320 rooms equipped. Uh, we record about 55,000 hours of lectures a year. So it's, it's not, not 55,000 events, but 55,000 hours, because uh, most of our lectures are almost two hours long. Uh, we, by the end of our semester, which finishes in May, June time, we'll have about 137,000 hours of video in our repository. And we think that's going to grow over the next two, three, two to three years to about a quarter of a million um, uh, archived hours of uh, lectures. Um, and this generates quite a lot of views, so almost all of our content is only for our own students, but we still see about 5 million views of these, uh, what we call podcasts and you would call recorded lectures um, uh, per year. So it's a very large, uh, high throughput um, uh, operation. And uh, I thought I should just include a screenshot of our, our, our lovely video portal. So this is where students go to access their content. Most of it is just simply uh, PowerPoint recordings. So we record from the projector uh, with sound, and then, then we distribute that and we call it a podcast. But increasingly, you're seeing more sophisticated video-based content. So this is a, a lesson series being taught on a sign language. Uh, so... Um, We've, we didn't start, uh, you know, lecture capture, you know, immediately going and recording 55,000 hours a year. That, that's changed over time. So we started a pilot in 2011 where we, record, we were recording about 1% of all the lectures at the university and 99% went unrecorded. And then uh, we switched to Opencast about here and we moved up to about 2% of lectures, which was, you know, a big achievement for us. And then clearly something happens here and the numbers start to radically change. So what happened was um, an opt-out policy was passed and uh, that meant that um, uh, we started recording everyone by default unless they said uh, no thanks. So uh, at our institution in 2013, uh, lecturers were basically given this choice. So if you have a lecture in our timetable and you do nothing, uh, you get recorded. That's great. So recording's made and it's available to all your, your students on your course. Alternatively, you could opt out and decline to be recorded, uh, and that's fine too, and then no recording would be made. And lastly, there was a third choice, which was uh, trim hold. So you could still be recorded, but you'd edit your recording before uh, it being delivered to students. Um, and uh, again, that's quite straightforward. It's about 2% of our staff choose to edit their lectures in advance, so it's, it's not that many. And uh, we've been operating like this for the last three years, I think. Um, and uh, there's a problem with this. We, we have a policy that says we're going to record people by default, but it had a little asterisk at the end that said, um, if you were a student with disabilities and you needed a recording, we would make a recording regardless of this opt-out option. So uh, something like this. Um, if, a, uh, if an opt-out happened, a recording would be made for our DAS students, our disabled students, but then only delivered to them. And uh, we haven't done that part of the policy for the last three years. So we had a project going over the previous summer to uh, enable that to happen. But also it wasn't quite that simple. We, we had a, an extra caveat where there were these 2% of recordings and sometimes people would leave them on hold for weeks or months or maybe forever. You know, they would never edit them. So we had to change this a little bit and have it so that... Um, uh, it went into the trim hold state, but it was also published only to disabled students. And then when eventually someone got around to editing it, it would be overwritten, and then a version would be available to the entire class. 
So the choices have become a bit more complicated at this point, and uh, James is going to explain um, uh, on a technical level um, how this was achieved. But um, we've been running with this new arrangement of uh, no opt-out anymore, really. And um, uh, so uh, we've done that for one semester, so I just wanted to show some numbers from uh, our semester. So uh, this is what our raw opt-out figure looks like. Uh, and so 18% of people currently decline to be recorded at the University of Manchester, which again is quite successful. But if you then map on how, the, uh, how many disabled students there are on courses, we're now up to 97% uh, of all the lecture content at the university is recorded. So there's only a tiny little 3% which is genuinely not uh, recorded as a result of opt-out. And this has been really successful. It's probably the biggest and best thing we've done since we implemented the opt-out policy. So we surveyed disabled students who had access to these additional recordings to find out you know, what they thought of them and how they affected their education. So I, I don't normally just read out text verbatim, but these are just four quotes from students that typify hundreds and hundreds of quotes we, we had in our surveying. So uh, 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 it makes it much more accessible, and I feel much more included and valued as a member of the university. So this is ide an ideal outcome for us, that we're enabling disabled students in a way that wasn't previously possible. Another student said it completely transformed how they were able to learn. And uh, uh, this student said this has genuinely been perhaps the most important help from the entire DAS experience. And then lastly, I quite liked this quote, uh, never get rid of podcasts or I would fail without them. So we're having quite a substantial impact in terms of how they think about lecture capture. And then we asked them some more sort of uh, precise questions we could get data on. So we asked how often students, these again are specifically students with disabilities, how often did they use lecture capture? And uh, five is uh, uh, very often and four is often. So um, uh, we've got nearly 90% of students using these recorded lectures uh, frequently. Uh, we asked them how important they regarded these additional opted out lectures uh, and uh, uh, we had 82% calling them essential and then if you add that with the next nearest category it goes up to something like 96% seeing these as a very important part of their education. Uh, we were worried about microphones, so this is a good microphoning setup, and we were concerned that staff that opted out wouldn't make the effort to put on lapel mics or they might you know, try and interfere with the microphones in some way. So this trend going in this direction is a positive one for us, where it appears that most students say that their, their recordings are not having routine microphone issues. Uh, we were also concerned that our timetabling data might not be so good and we might miss uh, recording events uh, uh, that we should record but that don't get recorded because of bad timetable data. And it is an issue, but not quite as bad as we thought it was. And then uh, the last couple of questions we asked, we uh, asked them uh, uh, if they believed it would make a, a difference to their assessment marks. And again, you know, 64% saying that they believed that uh, it would make a significant improvement to their, their end of unit assessments. Uh, so just before I hand over to James, a question that I get asked frequently, and we, we, I managed to generate some data for this uh, uh, presentation, um, is uh, 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 do people still turn up to class if stuff is recorded? And um, so I managed to find uh, some uh, information on this. So for the last uh, decade, um, uh, at the request of our UK government, we have to survey how many people are in the room. So um, uh, during a two-week period every year, uh, someone would come to a room like this. This room might be booked for 100 people, and then they would count how many, literally do a head count, and count how many people are in the room. And uh, we get graphs like this. So uh, the top blue bar is uh, the percentage occupancy that is expected, and then the green line is the um, actual occupancy. Um, and then uh, this is uh, 10 years' worth of data, and if you map on our lecture capture statistics, you can see that these trends really haven't changed. In fact, um, the actual occupancy is closed by like 1% or 2% on the expected occupancy. And this is across thousands and thousands of samples uh, done over a 10-year period. So we're reasonably confident that either lecture capture has no effect on attendance, or, you know, again, lecture cap uh, attendance would have to have gone up massively in some units in order for it to have gone down in others. Okay, so um, I'll hand over to James now just to do the technical bit and then we'll take questions at the end if that's okay.